I've been thinking about criminal justice reform, and I think you should be too. Hi, I'm Dan Satterberg. I'm the King County Prosecuting Attorney here in Seattle, Washington, and I've been a prosecutor now for 30 years. I've seen the pendulum swing back and forth in crime and politics and public policy, and I think right now is a historic opportunity for us to be considering wholesale reform of how we think about criminal justice. I think there's three primary reasons why now is the time that we should do this. First, we've never been safer. Crime rates in the United States are back to 1965 levels. Second, mass incarceration. In fact, if we were going to go back to the incarceration rate of 1965, we'd need to release 80% of the people in prison. The United States has quadrupled its rate of incarceration of its citizens during the last 30 years. And finally, racial and ethnic disproportionality in the criminal justice system today, a byproduct of mass incarceration, has created a tremendous chasm of mistrust between the communities most impacted by the criminal justice system and those in charge of public safety. Now is the time for us to think about the criminal justice system. But when you think about the criminal justice system, I find it useful to step back and see where the system fits in the entire society that we belong in. When I think about criminal justice reform, then I like to step back and think about the input. What is it that causes people to fall into the criminal justice system? Second, we need to think about the process. What happens in the criminal justice system after a person's been charged, finds himself in court? The process is important, but my point is, if all we do is think about what happens after a person's been arrested and charged with a crime, we're never going to do anything significantly about the rate of incarceration in the United States. Finally, what should we expect when we send someone to prison? What should be the quality of their experience to prepare them for life on the outside? I want to talk now about the state of Washington and our experience over the last 35 years. And in many ways, what we've done in Washington state makes criminal justice reform even a greater challenge than in the rest of the United States. First of all, the good news. In the last 35 years, serious felony crimes are down 43% in our state. At the same time, investment of public money is up over 120%. The average taxpayer now spending on the criminal justice system that we have from police and courts and jails and prosecutors and public defenders, all of that has gone up to 120%, making the criminal justice system stand out as the best funded system in our society. Now, the state of Washington imprisons 269 people per 100,000 citizens, a number that's absolutely meaningless unless you look around the rest of the country. Well, Oregon is higher at 361, California at 439, but none of those states come close to the national average of 497. That's one of the reasons that the state of Washington faces a more difficult challenge uh, in criminal justice reform is because we've already done some things that make us uh, ahead of the rest of the nation. In fact, we rank in the bottom 10 states in the use of incarceration. So who's in prison today in Washington? Well, mostly men. 93% of the inmates are men. And mostly people are there for violent offenses and sex offenses. Interestingly, in the discussion of criminal justice reform, many people focus on the war on drugs. But in the state of Washington today, fewer than 8% of our inmates are there serving a sentence for a drug crime. Compare that to other states where a quarter or a third of their inmates, or even the federal government where almost half of all inmates are there for drug offenses, Washington state has made smart choices about putting treatment-oriented programs at the court level, at the drug court level, and keeping people out of prison for crimes involving drugs. Having done all of this and being one of the lowest utilizers of incarceration, though, the state of Washington nevertheless faces this daunting task. Our prisons are at 100% capacity. If we don't do anything about policy or practice or we're thinking about criminal justice reform, we're going to need another 1,400-bed facility within nine years. That'll cost another $200 million. Maybe we'll have to build that prison. But before we do, we should be asking ourselves these questions. What about education? It is undeniable about the protective power of education. Did you know that three out of four inmates in our state prison dropped out of high school? And that if you drop out of high school, you're five times more likely to go to prison. What about college? Well, if we can get a little bit of college experience, 
uh, people are much, much less likely to go to prison. The protective power of education is like a blanket wrapped around a person, and the more education they have, the more engagement in school they have, the less likely they are to be involved in crime. When I first heard about this phenomenon called the school to prison pipeline, I wanted to believe it wasn't so. But it, it seems that there's a direct relationship between school disciplinary policies and the graduation rate. We need to ask more of our schools. We need to graduate more kids, and we need to discipline kids within school and not kick them out to the streets where they're more likely to be involved in criminal justice. What about the mental health system? You saw the graph for the investment in public money in the criminal justice system. The same graph can be shown in the reverse for the mental health system. In fact, in, since the 1955, we've lost 95% of our inpatient capacity to treat people with serious mental illness. And when we deinstitutionalized, which was a valid idea at the time because the institutions were not helping people, it warehousing people. But when we did that, we did so on the promise that there would be community outpatient programs that have not surfaced in numbers sufficient to provide help for people suffering from mental illness. So the default system for the mentally ill is the streets, the jails, and the prisons. Yes, the system is important, and as a prosecutor, I'm not here to point fingers upstream. One of the things that prosecutors have to do is quality control. We have to make sure that cases that come into the system are really worth coming into the system, that there's no other way in the community to deal with them. That's why I look at diversion programs as being the thing that's the prosecutor's first responsibility. Are there more effective ways to deal with this, these cases? Are there more efficient ways, particularly in juvenile crime on the first brush with the law? Why can't we bring kids back to the community that they offended against and learn a lesson there? Why do they need to be in court or face detention time? In addition to diversion, prosecutors have a special responsibility in the reform of the sentencing laws of our state. Today, we're thinking about going back to an older system where Fewer people would go to prison for shorter time, but it would be followed in the community by community corrections officers who would not only make sure that people are abiding by the conditions of the sentence, but would avail themselves of some of the new cognitive behavioral therapies out there to change the way people think in hopes that it will change the way that they act. You know, we've been so concerned in the last 30 years about building enough beds about the quantity of the Department of Corrections that we haven't been given enough thought to what the quality of that experience would be. There are a number of things that I think the Department of Corrections needs to do and that we all need to do to get people ready to re-enter society. After all, more than 98% of the people we send to prison are going to come back out someday. And the question is, will they have the skills, will they have the opportunities to be successful, or are they going to be another recidivism statistic? There's a few things that we need to do immediately that are symbolic yet important. The first would be when people get out of prison, no longer should they be given a Department of Corrections ID. They should get a Washington State ID that shows that they are ready to join the society. Second, let's remove this ridiculous prohibition against state money being used to fund higher education in prison. We know that any amount of college education is another protective layer around a person, makes them much less likely to be involved in crime again and makes them much more likely to successfully re-enter the community. While we're at it, we need to increase the amount of vocational and educational opportunities in every prison in our state so that we have this captive audience and that we expect them to do some things to make themselves better to re-enter society. Finally, for those who are suffering from mental illness, we need to provide the kind of support both inside and when they are released to make sure that they can make that successful transition as well. When people come out of prison right now, nationwide, only 50% of them are going to succeed. The road to reentry is made very difficult uh, by community attitudes as well as by law. In the state of Washington, we don't have a reentry division per se, but the reentry plan for inmates today is that they get $40 in gate money, some clean clothes, and a bus ticket back to this county where they were convicted from, whether they want to go back there or not. That is the reentry program. And the state of Washington has a recidivism rate of 28%. That looks good compared to some states in the union, but in our system, 
Of course, you have to be not only arrested but convicted of a crime with a high enough seriousness level to go back to DOC. When you think about that, and that 28% of the people who we're letting out this week from prison are going to be back in three years, that's nothing to brag about. We can do better. We must do better. We set up barriers to people to succeed. This is not always something that's done by the court. In fact, many of the collateral consequences have been put there by Congress or by the state legislature. In fact, in Washington state, there are 90 different professional licenses that you cannot even apply for. You can't be a cosmetologist or a chiropractor. You can't be a real estate agent. There's 90 different occupations that would be good jobs that people cannot apply for because they have a felony on their conviction. We need to do something about that and make it okay again to welcome people back from prison. You know, I think about criminal justice reform, I think about it in terms of the broad horizon of our community. And I think maybe it's time for us to stop talking about social justice and criminal justice as opposite ends of the sphere. I think that they're exactly the same thing. I mean, is it social justice or criminal justice to make sure that every young person has the ability to go to a good school and to graduate and that if they're disciplined, they're disciplined in school? Is it social justice or criminal justice to provide mental health care for people who need it before they become victims or offenders? Is it social justice or criminal justice to develop a curriculum within the prisons that will provide the skills and the hope and the opportunities for people to successfully re-enter? I think it's just justice. If we think about the criminal justice system as a part of a larger community that each of our systems deals with complex social issues, that there are limitations that can be expected out of the criminal justice system. Together, we have the power to shape a criminal justice system that reflects our values and that will help us overcome this period of mass incarceration and racial disproportionality. Thank you.